Up next, the story of one of the biggest songs of 1989 from a co-writer who worked with one of music history's greatest icons to bring a composition that would breed both controversy and it would complete the transition from star to a serious artist. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If you are passionate about music, music history, the stories of the songs, then you're gonna love this channel. We would love to have you be a part of our community. Subscribe below so you never miss an episode of our daily content. Uh, make sure to also check us out on Patreon where you can become an insider, you can get more content, and you can even have a part in curating this history. 1989 was a red letter year for music. You know, as the last year of the 80s, music was transitioning to the upcoming decade. You know, it seemed that as the year progressed and we moved toward the 90s, the mainstream uh, was becoming more pop oriented after hard rock and metal had really dominated for several years. I mean, from 86 to 88, you had Bon Jovi, Def Leppard, Guns N' Roses, White Snake, so many more who just scoured the charts, both the album charts and the singles charts. In the middle of the 80s, you know, it seemed like it was a battle of the icons when Michael Jackson and Prince battled it out and, you know, Madonna and Springsteen were entering the ring just at that time. George Michael, Whitney Houston, Janet Jackson would later kind of do the same. Uh, by 1989, Prince and uh, Bruce had changed their focus to making music on their own terms. What I mean is that they'd never really aim any of their next music at the masses like Purple Rain or Born in the USA ever again. Tunnel of Love and Sign of the Times uh, would prove this out, though I guess there was Bat Dance. That was a blip compared to what Prince would create going forward. MJ's follow-up to Thriller, while possessing five number one hits, it wouldn't have the same impact at all. Uh, George Michael was at a crossroads. He was having a crisis of pop fame and no longer wanted to shake his booty and look sexy. And he wanted to create music that would potentially change the world. Janet Jackson was doing the same thing. Um, you know, Whitney Houston was uh, figuring it out as well. We'll definitely cover that period of, of those stars soon, especially George Michael. Uh, let us know in the comments if you'd like to see that, what you'd like to see. As for Madonna, she entered 1989 ready to release her third straight album since conquering the masses with Like a Virgin in 1984. I mean, lover or hater, Madonna is a force. In my opinion, though, her output in the 80s was, was great. She was a master of balancing art and commerce, flair and dare, controversy with catchiness, if you will. And she was always pushing the envelope, even if you were too busy singing along to the hooks to notice. I mean, think about songs like Material Girl. Material world, and I am a material girl. Dress You Up, the aforementioned Like a Virgin, and then Live to Tell. Papa Don't Preachin', of course, Like a Prayer. The title track from her number one album by the same name, it's just pop extravagance. Uh, Prince played guitar on the song. Andre Crouch and his fierce gospel choir brought the song to amazing heights. Uh, it's a pop masterpiece. You can truly appreciate this just irresistible slice of 80s pop genius. It really is amazing. Sire Records released Like a Prayer as the album's lead single on March 3rd, 1989. It was written and produced by Madonna and frequent collaborator Patrick Leonard. The track foreshadowed an artistic and personal aspect to songwriting for Madonna, who reasonably thought that she needed to cater to more to her adult audience. They were growing up along with her. The song is about a fervent young girl who loves God, who is the only male in her life. It did become Madonna's seventh number one single in America. It also went to number one in Canada, I think Spain, Australia, New Zealand, also the UK. Like most of Madonna's songs, it spawned controversy when it was released, especially the music video and campaign with Pepsi Cola. With depictions of Catholic symbols like stigmata, the video was condemned by the Vatican at the time. Some family and religious groups protested against the Pepsi campaign. Uh, they boycotted the drink. Under pressure, Pepsi actually canceled their sponsorship contract with a Madonna, but allowed her to keep the fee that they had agreed on. Definitely one of the most memorable videos of its era. It was directed by Mary Lambert. Around the time uh, 
uh, all that transpired with Madonna. Uh, she was transitioning from a teen audience to more adult fare, like I said. She had recently appeared in films like Shanghai Surprise and Who's That Girl, which both failed critically and commercially. She also appeared on Broadway in the production Speed the Plow around that time. Uh, her marriage to Sean Penn had been dissolved in early 1989. She also turned 30. This was the same age her mother was when she passed away, sadly. All of these instances brought uh, emotional pain and reflection. She even talked about it in a rare interview at that time, implying that her Catholic upbringing left her feeling guilt all the time. She said, and I quote, uh, once you're a Catholic, you're always a Catholic in terms of your feelings of guilt and remorse and whether you've sinned or not. Sometimes I'm racked with guilt when I needn't be, and that to me is left over from my Catholic upbringing because in Catholicism, you were born a sinner and you are a sinner all your life. Uh, no matter how you try to get away from it, the sin is within you all the time, end quote. Well, I mean, we are all sinners. Um, but Madonna's audience, like I said, they were aging along with her and she felt that uh, she wanted the sound of her new record, that it should change. Uh, and there were certain personal matters in her thought process uh, around that time. This became her musical journey, which is apparent in the lead single, Like a Prayer. In fact, Madonna went through her own personal private diaries as she was searching for her muse. She would even imply in another interview, what was it I wanted to say? I wanted the album to speak things on my mind. It was a complex time in my life, end of quote. As she developed Like a Prayer, you know, she knew she had a powerhouse and that it would be the title track, the lead single. It was the most ambitious work that she'd ever attempted at that point. As she started to put the songs on the album together, uh, Madonna relied upon her frequent brilliant collaborators, I must say. Stephen Bray, who was in the band The Breakfast Club uh, with The Material Girl. He wrote a lot of uh, her early hit, or co-wrote a lot of her early hits. And Patrick Leonard, the great Patrick Leonard, who had written several songs with the pop star, including uh, one of my favorites, Live to Tell. Both Bray and Leonard brought in instrumental tracks and you know half-baked concepts to the queen of pop to consider even for Like a Prayer. At that moment, Madonna felt that Pat Leonard's concept for Like a Prayer was very interesting, and they started to build on that. Gosh, I was very fortunate to sit down with Pat Leonard in his home and discuss the creation of Like a Prayer in detail. He's an incredible interview. He was actually at the piano and actually points out some of the variations in it. It's an interesting, very interesting behind the scenes look at how they fashioned this number one smash in this pop masterpiece. We're gonna go into that now. As we go into this interview, I do wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. The only glasses that I wear. One of the many great features of Zenny is that when uh, you get your eyewear from them, you can actually say goodbye to foggy lenses and glare with Zenny's advanced two-in-one anti-fog and anti-reflective coating. I've got it on here. It's so important, especially right now. Go to zenny.com, design your own glasses. Treat yourself, you deserve it. Here is Patrick Leonard on the story of the number one hit, Like a Prayer. I hear you call my name. Let's talk about Like a Prayer, the song, because it's the Madonna song for me that just is that wall of sound. It's got so much going on. And it's like I said, it's like a, the 80s pocket symphony. I used to talk about Sgt. Pepper and Pet Sounds being the pocket symphony. Mm -hmm. That song really lends itself to that. Tell me about that. We were writing a, another record and we wrote for two weeks. And in those two weeks, we wrote every song. And it was one song a day. And that was one of the days. Jeez. And that was it. And, wow. I mean, I'm telling you the truth. That was it. We wrote, wrote for 10 days and we wrote 10 songs. Jeez. Those were the songs. And I don't think there was anything that didn't get used. And many times, and I don't know about Like a Prayer, I don't remember, but many times the day, she, the day we wrote it, the day she sang it, that was it. That was it. Never sang it again. Never played it again. Just overdubbed on it. A lot of work went into Like a Prayer, but you know, it was 10 weeks or something. It wasn't 20. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was fast and condensed, and especially when you bring in choirs and orchestras and, right. you know, a couple different rhythm sections. and Andre Crouch and the choir. Yeah. And... I remember 
the suggestion of the title, you know, like there was a kind of a physical position in the studio. I had a station with a keyboard and a bunch of keyboards like these hooked up. I mean, some of these are still the same ones. Her sitting on the floor and she'd start writing. She'd kneel on the floor and she'd write on a legal pad. And at some point, she looked up and she went, how about like a prayer? I said, good. <laughs> she just keeps writing, goes to the bathroom, writes a little more. I said, okay, let's try it. And oftentimes, like, that was it, you know? Really, really focused. And I think we were both really focused, but she's crazy focused. I mean, she's really amazing that way. And then what do you do to get the verses to move but not have anything too big? So Luis Conte put bracelets on a piece of foam and tapped them with little pieces of metal. Like, that's the whole rhythm in the verses every time which scared everybody to death but her and me. I, I thought it was, a, that's what made it work, was this thing where it's so tiny and it's so big and yeah. so tiny and so big. I mean, without the perspective shift, everything, it's, everything is here. You know, I mean, when you go from here to here, this becomes huge. Do you remember uh, how it started on piano? Or she yes. just wrote the lyrics and you kind of... No, I mean, I, when she got there, I already had a track. I would already have a track. That's how it started. And then we went... If you, if you hear it like this, it's a gospel song. You know what I mean? And that's how it's written. It's 4 5 1. So, why in the heck have you not put together a, an album of? Those songs playing on the piano just like that, because I would listen to that album every day. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Cause, well, I'll make you one. Uh, seriously, <laughs> these three these three songs are my three favorite Madonna songs, and really three of my favorite pop songs. Period from the last yeah. for my life, and hearing you play them like that, it, it's just it brings a, a solemn peace that I haven't heard. Mm. Yeah. Very spiritual. There's a lot of spirituality in that song. Yeah. It's a gospel. How does spirituality play a part in when you wrote music? Does it, does it play because when you're writing something that beautiful, you have to be in. You're tapping into something there. You have to be in touch in something, not just the darkness. No, you can be just be the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, like. There is this, you know, the spiritual, no, I don't, want to go, I don't want to go there, but there's this, you know, people always say, well, you don't actually do it, you're just a conduit to something. And, you know, to some degree, I believe that's true, except that I've studied piano since I was three, so it's not, you know, I'm not just a conduit, I'm a conduit that worked really hard at yeah. learning my craft and playing a lot, so I have good technique and listen to a lot of music. I mean, like, I think we're just a product of who we are, and, you know, I, I came from a mining town in Michigan, you know, when the mines closed and everybody had to leave. And my tendency when I sit down, you know, is not to go. It's to go. Yeah. Like right away. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm just going to sit down and go. Because it's, it's, it's what my mind does. It's what, it's how I feel. I, I want to be able to do things that aren't muso. Like, I don't want to get a bunch of people in and start doing the kicks that, like, I don't want it to sound anything like those records. Right. And not because I don't love the records. I just feel no. like I'd like it to be about how I think. And I do think in that, in that thing of what can I play with that's not been done a thousand times, you know? And here I am all yeah. these years later trying to kind of figure out if I can just go play the piano somewhere, you know? And if maybe some people would be interested because... 
I wrote like a prayer. Yeah. <laughs> you know? What's interesting is I read about how the song came together. It, um, there's a lot of different things going on, some bongos and stuff. And as the producer, you kind of say, well, let's take that out and leave some space in the song. I, I read that. Do you remember yeah. that now? No. <laughs> I mean, I seem to remember that it was, it was a, that chorus, you know, you had Luis Conte there. So, you know, when you go that we want very little going on, he's going to go to something small. It would make sense that it was something like bongos or, you know, a single-handed drum or something. And I think I just, I think we just felt like, well, what if, what if it just doesn't, you know, we want to have the rhythm, but what if it's just implied? And ironically, at this point, that range of my hearing after 45 years in the studio, I can't hear those bracelets anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird because I, you know, if I'm in the in a restaurant or something and the song comes on, I'm like, first is coming, I go like, I wonder if the other people in the restaurant can hear the bracelets. Because <laughs> without it, it's pretty strange without some rhythm. And I don't hear yeah. the rhythm. I've read somewhere that the big guitar part before it goes was Prince. Prince. Yeah. My front door slams. A sample from Andre Coach's choir. Yeah, he played on he played on the whole song and we took it and used it in the front. I'm not sure if it's him playing along in the end or if it's Chester. Because Chester played on that too. And Guy Pratt's amazing ending bass thing I'm like crazy. I don't oh, know yeah. who that is. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this 80s pop extraordinaire and Patrick Leonard and Madonna, the queen of pop, below. Love to hear your opinions. If you like our videos, we do invite you to subscribe to be a part of this community. Get our newest t-shirts and check out our links in the description for that. You're going to love these. To get even more content, like I said, Insider Access, you can join us on Patreon. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe out there.